So this is a talk about the IPython notebook. Hopefully both you and I are in, this, in the correct room. Um, so I, this entire talk will be run off of the IPython notebook. And the IPython notebook is uh, a fantastic tool. So here's, I'm going to start it from the command line so you can see how this looks when you run it. So what happens when you first start the IPython notebook is you have a, a server starts running in the background. You have this thing rendered to uh, a local place that you can access with your browser, and then you interact with the Python kernel through the browser. And um, it's a pretty neat tool. So I hope to show you some of the capabilities and part of the reasons I've been excited about this for a couple of years, actually. So let's just do a new uh, terminal here. So I ran um, that IPython notebook command in this folder, which has these directories, and you see the directories here as well. Um, nothing in here is an IPython notebook, but you're running and you see this, this structure here. So we have, um, you can navigate through and find something labeled IPYNB and go for that. Okay, slides, we have slides. So one of the many things that you can do with the IPython notebook is that there's version control and you can revert to something if you've made some sort of catastrophic last minute change. Um, so let us hope that everything else just runs quite smoothly. All right. Um, so here are the slides. So we are in progress. Um, so the title of the talk is IPython Notebook, Press Best Practices for Data Science. My name is Jonathan Whitmore. I work for a place called Silicon Valley Data Science. Uh, it's located in Silicon Valley. We do data science. Um, that's our, both of our Twitter handles, and I re affectionately refer to it as SVDS because it's a shorter um, acronym. It should actually be called probably the Jupyter Notebook Best Practices for Data Science because uh, the Jupyter Notebook is actually IPython Notebook 3 and on. And the reason it's called that is because it's a portmanteau of Julia, Python, and R, so Jupyter is the only way they can make it a word. And so Jupyter together gives you the name Jupyter Notebook. Um, and it's just a rebranding. So it's the same people working on the Jupyter Notebook as IPython Notebook, just to set that up to begin with. So my background is uh, that I used to be an astrophysicist. I got my PhD in physics from UC San Diego in 2011. I did a three-year astrophysics postdoc in Australia. I've been using IPython and Python since 2007. Um, and I've been a user of the IPython notebook since basically it came out, which is like late 2011, early 2012. My background currently is that I'm a data scientist at this place called Silicon Valley Data Science, or a boutique consulting uh, firm. We tend to work on small teams from four to six people with these teams, uh, different clients. Um, these teams are two to three data scientists, typically with two to three data engineers. And we're thrown into many different technical environments. Sometimes we can use GitHub, which is great. Sometimes we can't, which is fine. Uh, sometimes we use Python. Sometimes we use R. Uh, just the, the, the needs determine what we actually use. But the Jupyter Notebook, when we have our own choices, has been very popular with our fellow data scientists, and not just at data, at Silicon Valley Data Science, but also um, throughout the whole data science community. Can I just get a brief show of hands of people who've actually used the IPython Notebook? And okay, so how many people consider themselves more developers? How people consider themselves more like data science? Okay, so it's gonna be a, a developer heavy thing. No problem. So the quick outline of this talk uh, will be, I'll give you some tips and tricks throughout to how to use the IPython notebook and how I use it uh, and how we try to use it in an effective way. Um, and I'll give you a quick demo of the Jupyter notebook. The, um, and then talk about some of the ways you can organize the notebook itself as well as the workflows around that. And specifically, I'll be talking about how teams can use the notebook in a nice, in a nice way. Finally, I'll give you a GitHub repo of this notebook, uh, which you can tell is actually available <laughs> um, in this talk. So I'll, I'll be going through that as well. All right, so now it's time for a demo to introduce the Jupyter notebook. And hopefully this is... Uh, and show you some reasons why I think this is amazing, an amazing tool. All right. So this, let's go back here. Just trying to see what I was left with after the purge. Um, 
just don't do it. Initial cleanup. I have one last thing that I can grab if you just bear with me another 30 seconds. I'm very sorry for this. Simple demo. This is what I want. Simple 20% 20 demo, perfect. All right. So this is a running IPython notebook itself. And what you see here is a couple of things. Uh, this is a cell, and it's based by you write code in a cell, then you execute the cell. So I'll be doing a lot of command line or keyboard shortcuts on this. Um, but this first thing is prepended with a percent sign, which isn't standard Python code, but it has been uh, what's called an IPython magic function. And this loads matplotlib in a way that's nice to use with the notebook. And then there's other imports, which are standard Python imports. And I'm executing this by hitting shift enter on the cell, and then it runs, and the input runs with no output. Uh, there's some customizations here. So I use uh, Seaborn, which is a fantastic thing that uses matplotlib basically as a backend and has some nice defaults for how the plots should be looking. And I have any tweaks to what I expect the matplotlib library to be doing, or even the Seaborn library to be doing, and I put here at the top of the notebook so that anyone who sees this notebook can actually reproduce what I did rather than just have to rely on either having access to my matplotlib RC or some other personalization, which I think is just a generally good idea, especially if you're sharing notebooks between people. All right, so let's load some data in, because this is what we're interested in as data scientists. Uh, so the data is going to come from this website here. So you can display websites, by the way, internally in the IPython notebook. So this is the US Energy Information Administration. And this is stuff about coal. And I just took some of the production data, uh, how the productivity of coal. So in, in embed iframes, which is kind of fun. I will load a data frame. I call it D frame. And it's going to be a pandas read of a CSV called uh, coal production cleaned. So execute that again with uh, shift enter. And to explore, to see what's in the data frame, if you do a dot head on it, you see just the first couple rows. So here's some of the data that's held in that CSV file that's now parsed into a data frame structure. So this is Panda's uh, way of thinking about things. And at the top, you see the different column headers. And as you go across, you can see that there's a bunch of different columns with different types of data in there. Now, I recommend doing a dot head just for keeping your memory locally uh, sane. Because if you do, let's see, how many was this? Oh, seven. You can access output from previous cells by doing this underscore seven thing, for example. So this is actually outputting the, the output from the seventh call. And you can also do the input, which is underscore i7. So if you actually just, instead of doing dot head, just as a side tip here, you did the whole thing, uh, that whole stuff, it will be stored in future accessible calls. So it just for memory purposes, generally just do a data frame dot head or D frame. Um, so I'm going to do a plot now. And one thing that should be mentioned is that when you're doing plots or diff different code pieces, try to put them in, a, in small executable uh, chunks that make sense. Um, don't be loading in the data every time that you want to run a plot. So have that be a logical separation between each of these cells. Uh, so here I'll just run this plot. Now, you can't make this any more simple than that. Let me just make this oh, it is smaller. Um, let's zoom out a bit then. Put that back. 
So you would like to do with a, the plotting command, generally you keep all of that kind of code in a single cell, uh, because that's about the smallest logical piece you could actually do that. So what I've just plotted here was the D frame, and I accessed that column average employees by doing a dot average employees. There's other ways of accessing it by doing it with the name, especially if it has a space in the, the thing, so it's average space employees, this would not work. So this is uh, the number of hours worked versus the number of employees you have, which is a nice linear relationship like you'd expect. And let's just look at another one. This is total production versus total hours worked. So you can see the productivity versus total employee hours worked in this case. And this might give you some things that you might think to start exploring, like why are there two, it looks like two rough trends. There's a pretty flat trend and then there's a pretty sharp trend. Are they differentiated by mine type or maybe location or something like this? And this kind of rapid data exploration is what the notebook is fantastic for. And if I was to share this with someone, it already tell, you already know where the data comes from, uh, you know what it looks like, and you know the relationships that I'm looking at. So that's all very handy. You can do other things like import color palettes. Sorry, did someone ask a question? Or all right, um, you can do plots and make them look better or more pretty, or you can be plotting anything you want to. Now there's a a lot of tools that come with a notebook, and part of the ecosystem of what makes the notebook so useful and, and why I love it so much is that there's notebook extensions that really extend your power. And sometimes you, people haven't seen some of these extensions, so I just wanted to uh, highlight a few of my favorites. So there's one called QGrid, which is, I think, basically a, a finance one. But you can actually show the IPython notebook internally in the notebook at least, as this kind of um, an explorable table. So this way you can actually click on these different headers and sort by those things. So you can actually look at this in a fairly interactive way. So instead of plotting it, you can actually you know, uh, sort through the actual notebook itself. So QGrid is one fun one. And one thing that we use all the time in my client work is using SQL queries and various things. And there's lots of bindings. And the current client um, uses Impala on top of Hadoop, and I do a, almost all of my uh, data visualization by querying Hadoop through uh, Impala from the notebook. And you might think that sounds kind of crazy, but here's a different one. This is just SQL and SQLite. Um, but I'm gonna produce a, a variable called co-production, which is just a copy of the data frame. And I'm going to push it into a SQLite database locally. So it's called persist uh, cold production. So now I have that data frame I've just been showing you, doing some plots from, and it's now a table in an SQL, um, SQLite uh, database. And you can query it. And so this is one of the ways you can do magic. So you saw a previous per, uh, percent sign at the top that loaded in things as a magic. There's double percent signs, which are called cell magics, which means everything else in that cell is going to be of that special type. So in this case, I have a double percent sign SQLite thing, which is how you connect to it. And this is a, a rather simple SQL query here. You can run that, no problem. It returns uh, that thing. So you can actually run the queries. And for future reference, if you want to see what I'm plotting, you can actually look back at the query I ran directly, and rather than having it be stored as a separate save file or somewhere else. And I find that to be very handy. You can also do these inline magics so you can do a, like a database test is equal to percent SQL select star from cold production, for example, and DB test is what, what you're seeing before. So I've actually just run a query on the, the table in that database. And this is, I had it come back as a pandas data frame, so I didn't store it in an intermediate stage. So this kind of thing makes data exploration fantastically easy and useful, as well as very shareable, and when you can combine things like running SQL queries, Impala, whatever kind of queries, and have that recorded in the process, it makes this document fantastically useful for, for teamwork. Any questions before I move on from this spot? Yes? I'm, I am editing it right now. Yeah. And I can rerun things, and you can get in trouble by running things out of order. Um, so you can, I can go up here and rerun something up here that um, you know, changes something. And that, that's a thing you just have to watch out with. Good question. 
Yes. So pandas has some, uh, the question is, from the CSV file, how do you determine this schema? So pandas has a library of reading CSV files that's it's pretty robust, and you can tell it to change things sometimes, like don't use these columns or whatever. Uh, but that's a pandas call, and it, it knew from the first line as being, well, you can either say the top line is the header or it isn't, and, and go from there. So it's a pandas thing. I can't take credit for that one, unfortunately. Okay, let's move on. And also, this um, presentation, by the way, is actually a live notebook. It's actually running, and you can actually edit it and run code executed in this in the slideshow itself, which is a pretty neat uh, ability here. So, I hope I've shown you at least a sketch of how data scientists, uh, how useful these notebooks can be for data scientists. Uh, so, how does a team of data scientists use the notebook effectively? Do we all use one notebook? Do we all use different notebooks? Do we share all the notebooks? Uh, should there be a directory in each person's laptop which has every notebook that they've ever done and then just query that? Um, a lot of hard questions, actually. So this problem is how do we organize our notebooks and the, with the goals of having our work be collaborative? We want to be able to see what everyone else is doing. Uh, we want it to be reliably captured and transparently shared both internally and with our clients that we're working with. And we'd like to clearly deliver the, the key insights to our clients. So oftentimes in the current client, we actually, the deliverable is the IPython notebook. They would like to actually see the code that produced the results and everything else, which is, which is really nice to be able to not have to separate this out into like a, a PowerPoint slide and, and go from there. It's actually all there uh, for them to see. And as you saw, you can revert to previous versions if you, if you absolutely need to. Okay, so main tip is a cognitive one and just ways to think about how you should structure your data science teamwork. So think about notebooks in two classes. You should think of notebooks as a lab notebook and other notebooks as deliverable notebooks. So what I mean by lab notebook, I mean like actual, think of a lab, lab notebook, exploratory data analysis, where you have a bench somewhere and you write down on a piece of paper the top of the page, the, t the name of the, the date, the date, what you found, uh, everything else, and you just turn, keep turning the pages and it stays there as a historical record. You don't go back and change the entry from three months prior if you have a new update in data or something like that. So it's more of like a historical record, a scratch place to keep some somewhat rough but not completely uh, rough analysis on a day-by-day -day basis. So the key point is you keep a historical record of the analysis that's explored. It's meant to be a development slash scratch space. Um, each notebook should be controlled by a single data scientist. For in this, each lab notebook should be controlled by a single data scientist. You should split the notebooks, in other words, turning the page, when they get kind of too long. And you can just get a feel for this. Like After they start to go on for enough time, you're scrolling down to the bottom of the page. Like, okay, it's time to do a new notebook and just date stamp the top of the, I'll show you how to name it in a second. Uh, and if you are working on two different projects at the same time, it makes sense to split the notebooks by topic as well. So just go ahead and, and do that. The deliverable notebook um, is any notebook that will be referenced in the future. So it doesn't have to be deliverable in the sense of like, this is going to be client facing or stakeholder facing. For example, it could be how the raw data was transformed into cleaned data. So the CSV file, if you saw the name of it as I loaded it in that example, was cold production underscore cleaned dot CSV. And so if, because I'll be using that uh, in the future, having a, a link back to how I cleaned that data is vital. Um, of course, deliverable notebooks can be the fully final polished outputs of the analysis. Um, but we also use the deliverable notebook uh, via some peer review pull requests. So other members will review the pull request before it's accepted. And these deliverable notebooks are controlled by the entire data science team in contrast to the lab notebook style. So let me just give a brief overview of the lab notebook. Just grab this.
So here's an example of how to set up your lab notebook. Let's toggle this header here. Um, so at the top of the page, I have an, a title that says like what you're looking, what you're working on, or the, the main thing, you're, the main point of this, even just what you're working on that afternoon, let's say. Uh, the analysis that's in this notebook should be at the top. So you have different things that you looked at. Maybe you asked some questions that you wanted to verify or, or just explore. So you say like, um, does the year predict how productive things are, for example? And you could say that's a dead end. This is, you don't have to do this, but I find it to be handy. Let me just zoom in just a bit to make it easier to read. Is that legible? Can you read that? Okay, I'm getting mostly nods. Okay. Um, so you have like dead ends that didn't work out, but have it recorded here. So if, say, three months from now, a different data science team member finds new data that says like, hey, did you ever look at this? You can, they can see the previous analysis you did, even though you think it's a dead end. And stuff like that happens all the time. Uh, you can also say ones that maybe weren't dead ends, but you're just kind of working on still, like does the hours work correlate with the production? Stuff like that. Um, and these cells, by the way, are, are markdown. So this can render markdown as well. This is what it looks like in markdown. And then when you render it, it looks nicer. So do your standard imports at the top of the page. So you should have your magics and then each of these things in alphabetical order at least. So you have your matplotlib inline. And I have a lot of extra stuff, uh, comments here, just so that um, it's hopefully if you get look at this later, you can see what I did and why. So I have more explanation than I'd expect in a standard notebook, but this is for pedagogical reasons. Um, it's also useful to have just run this this command as the version information. You can see which version of Python you ran, uh, the different libraries that you asked for, specifically what version it was, when you actually ran the notebook, so 1026, for example. Then you have your actual imports, set some uh, customizations, and I do this thing with the fig prefix, so I save figures into a different file and into a different directory, and they um, like to name this the same as the start file, the name of this, um, come on. So here's the, the file name, 2015-07-24 JW Coal Production. And so the figure that I'm saving out will start with 2015-07-24 JW. So that if I look in that directory, I know where, I have a record of where that figure came from. You might be thinking this is, this is crazy, but I'm gonna argue that it's not so crazy in a second. You have clean data, like I mentioned before. You can say, uh, you can have a link to the actual previous clean data and how you did it. So the data came from this thing here, and this is a full explanation of the cleaning data that you did before you got the final data cleaned version. Let's load this in. Let's see uh, a few plots. I did do that, didn't I? I didn't. Right on. Okay. So I have some plot here and some data analysis, and this is what I'm expecting to. And you saw that I saved this fig prefix plus production hours versus worked hours. And the reason for doing this currently, and this isn't going, if I gave this talk in a year's time, I suspect I wouldn't be saying to do this, but currently it's actually quite difficult to do diffs on notebooks. So if you, if I did some analysis that was terrible, let's say, um, not terrible, but let's say I did something that was, someone had some constructive criticism for, and you look at this commit, for example, where there was a clear outlier. This is a figure that is, you know, figures 2015 or 16 production, and someone said, this plot doesn't look so good. What happened here at this one data point? And I went back and I fixed it and I updated it. This commit has, in, through GitHub at least, this is a really nice thing that GitHub is do doing, is that you can actually have side-by-side -side versions of that plot itself, which when you're doing data science oftentimes is the thing that matters. You want to say like, hey, this plot doesn't look quite right. Did you look at this point or did you Think about this. So there's side-by-side -side analyses of differences of what the plot differences look like. You can also, there's just kind of a neat thing, you can do a swipe. So this, um, as you go from left to right, you can actually swipe back and forth and see what the changes were. So maybe it's a subtle change, maybe it's a color change. Uh, being able to, to swipe like that is nice, or onion skin, which just kind of fades between the two. 
um, is another way if you want to look at it. I just tend to look at it this way. Okay, so let's go back to slides. So naming things is a known difficult problem in computers, programming, and everything else, right? So uh, one of the ways that I recommend naming things in the develop slash laptop, uh, lab notebooks ways is by this following convention. So you start with the ISO 8601 date, which is just this bolded version of the date down here. Uh, and then you go to your data scientist initials. So this is how you can own your notebooks very, in a very simple way. So my initials are JW. And then a two to four word description about what you're actually working on. In this case, coal yearly productivity, for example. So if you name your development notebooks like this, it makes it very easy to query, by, well, first of all, by date, uh, or to, to sort and filter by date, or by the actual user, the data scientist, or by the data analysis that you are doing, if you've named them in a consistent way. So to get organized, at the high level with what, how you keep your directory structure for an entire project that is a data science project, I recommend starting with a data directory which is backed up in, a, in something outside of version control. So have your, especially if it's larger data, you, just, you can't keep it in version control. Um, I don't need to belabor that point. Um, you have a deliver notebook, which is again, the final polished notebooks for consumption or notebooks that will be referenced by other notebooks as in like, this is how I clean the data. Development. Um, directory, which is where your lab notebooks are stored. Figures, which is what I showed before, where your figures are stored. And then just a source directory, which has scripts. So if you do something repeatedly, if you have clean data, that's historical data, and that's not going to change. It makes sense to have just a notebook of how you clean the data um, and then how the output came. If you have a query that needs to run every single day or every time you run the analysis and that, that needs to happen, then that makes more sense to keep it as a script or some module somewhere so that in, in the source directory so you actually rerun that code a lot. So if you're running the code a lot, keep it as a module or a script. If you're just using the output a lot, just put it in a notebook. It's a bit easier. Okay, so now we come up with some problems that you need to work on as you work uh, in a team member. So how do you peer review code and store analysis and version control? And with a couple other version constraints. So let's say you have a project manager who wants to see the work in progress and wants to see the final results as well, but doesn't want to install uh, Python for whatever crazy reason they might not want to do that. Or let's say you're not using GitHub, which renders the figures nicely, allowing you to do the nice sweep back and forth, or you want to review the Python code itself. It's not the output in this case, it's the actual code um, that you want to look at. So I'm warning you, this is going to be semi-controversial recommendations come forthcoming. So I'm willing to take some flack over what I'm about to say. So bring it. Um, all right, so the short answer is, each data scientist, while they're working, they have their own development branch. Work is saved, pushed on the development branch every day. Uh, when you're ready to commit uh, to master, when you do a pull request, this part isn't so crazy. And then finally, when you commit, I want you to commit not only the IPython notebook itself, but a .py version of that notebook uh, and a .html version of that notebook and as well as all the figures, like I said before. So of all the, all the notebooks, of your development and of your deliverable notebooks. So it's right, you're saving it like three or four different ways. And um, I know you're thinking, okay, so source control is for source, so what's this output? I don't get it. Um, and so just a quick tip on how to do this in a way that doesn't drive yourself crazy and you can just keep things up to date. Uh, the following slide shows you code that you should add to your IPython notebook config file. And I have a snippet that you can actually just go here. So a bit.ly post save hook snippet. So if you actually want to see this code itself, that's and if you don't trust link shorteners, the full link is below it. So, um, and I've modified some code from a GitHub pull issue and uh, from M-I-N-R-K is the user who did that. So you add this snippet of code, this Python code to your IPython notebook config.py file. And what this will do is automatically every time you hit save on a notebook, it will render, it, it'll, it'll do a post save hook and create a file if it's not created already, a .py and a .html version of that notebook. And it will update it as every time you save it and just keep uh, overwriting that. 
So that's an easy way to, to do that. So you save first notebook.ipy, and you have two new files that are created. And every time you save it, the new ones get updated. So the standard pull request workflow, so GitHub has been doing really well, good stuff with that uh, figure notebook uh, sliding that I showed you. Uh, let me just do a quick demo of this part. So we're really getting a, a good back and forth on how the GitHub itself works. Uh, let's look at, I was, it was late and I was tired. What could go wrong? Uh, so you can see here the change in the IPython notebook, or I guess it's just an add. Let's look at a change. So I changed OzCon slides to this one thing, and the input version changed. And you'll see this as the differences in the IPy, uh, IPY and B type stuff. Uh, this is the HTML version, sorry. And you also get, if you change an image, usually a lot of text of how the image itself has changed, because it's a binary format. And that's unfortunate. But a person who's a project manager who wants to see what this looks like can just download the HTML, and it renders correctly. It renders as you'd, you'd hope it to render. In other words, it looks just like it looks in the browser here. So having the HTML file available with one click, either through GitHub or a different thing if you have to use something else, is fantastically useful for project managers uh, or anyone else who just doesn't want to have to spin up a IPython notebook server. Say you're doing it on the client's server somewhere and you don't want to have to render it and do an SSH tunnel, for example. Um, and then you have the versions of the .py changes, which should just change mostly the actual code itself that does those, those code changes. So if you have some detailed Python code that's being updated in your notebook, you can, you can easily track those changes. And um, finally, the, the figures itself look like this. So the benefits to all this is that you record your analysis, including dead ends, because they are oftentimes more useful than you'd ever expect. You allow it, people to easily peer review the analysis you did. They can look at the actual thought process and the code that produced any of the analysis that you did, including like, I think this is a dead end, and someone saying, it's actually not a dead end. You've, you, saw, you didn't see this outlier, for example, and you can go back and see that. Um, and project managers can easily see and read the analysis, either with GitHub with the IPYMB, which renders natively, which is fantastic, or with HTML, no need to install IPython. Just a few concluding remarks. So organizations of workflows and teams is a very difficult problem. Uh, having some standards is better than having none. Uh, sometimes having the wrong thing in the sense of version control and, and, and saving IPython notebook and the .py and the .html and the figures, which sounds terrible, I know, uh, can actually solve exactly all the problems that you tend to come up against. And so sometimes the wrong thing is the right thing in, in the right case. And I'm also, of course, open to new ideas. So if you have a better method, better idea, or a different thing to recommend, please let me know. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Jonathan Whitmore. Thank you. I think we have got time for like maybe one question, two questions. So yeah, you can also grab this talk via that directory there, which you which is proved by me <laughs> updating it live. Um, this post save hook that saves every time you hit save on a notebook um, is, can be found at this link. These creating Jupyter slides that are live that you can actually edit and run code while you're doing the demo um, is this rise package here, which is really nice. And just a shout out to nbdiff, which is a project that has, hasn't had so much love lately, but it's, um, I really hope it gets uh, kicked up again and people start to embrace it because uh, it, it was trying to solve nice notebook level diffs in a Git, in a Git um, version control. So I hope that that thing takes off a bit. Cool. Thank you very much, guys.